These are the Perry Street projects. Um, it was once upon a time ago affordable housing. It's since been condemned so nobody can legally live here. Uh, we know for a fact that there are several people that choose this as their nighttime residence. They break in through open windows and open doors and they create their own little homes here. Um, we actually do outreach here for the point in time count. Um, so I was here at five o'clock in the morning this year on a Friday in the middle of January, yelling in windows trying to see if I could get anybody to come out to be counted. Uh, we count how many homeless are living on the streets in Erie County every year in January. So that's a little bit about what this place is. So it used to be affordable housing and now it's not anymore. <laughs> We see that happen a lot, but the affordable housing just kind of gets swept by the wayside. Like what's happening over on the west side in the Shoreline Apartments, if any of you guys are familiar with those. So it's another affordable housing complex which they're tearing down to build million dollar condos. So a lot of people lost their homes, everybody had to be out September of last year. It's another place we have a lot of active people living. We have to worry about when the city does eventually condemn these. We have to really hope that the somebody that's supposed to check the buildings did their job, otherwise we lose our clients. That's happened, where they've tore down houses and later find the body. That's real life out here. <laughs> um, I've actually reached out to the cops to ask them to go through some of these buildings with us and they came back to me with, I suggest you don't, that's trespassing, we'll take care of it. They put up new boards and people found new ways in. So it doesn't really help, unfortunately. So you guys want to know what my lifestyle is about? Mm -hmm. yeah. us, being, us being homeless. All right, guys, I'm going to explain this to you guys. Being homeless, it's not easy. The food is not easy. But there's a lot of soup kitchens they can, you can go to, but you got to walk it. The soup kitchen. How do I live? I got tarps, I got blankets. That's how I sleep. Even through the winter and through the rain, that's how I sleep. It might be scary for you guys, but for me, it's not. Because I've done, I've been here for a long time doing it. Do you feel you are being dehumanized and treated less than? Less. They don't give too stuff about too much stuff about us. How long have you been homeless? Uh, about a year. How is life on a day-to-day -day basis? Tough. I gotta get up, go to dialysis, stab needles in my arm, clean my blood three times a week. I uh, have to get up. I have to. Uh, I'm around a bunch of alcoholics. I'm not an alcoholic. I don't drink at all. So everything they say, they lie, they cheat, they rob from me too. Uh, a little bit of disability a month. I buy my, my shampoo, deodorant, toothbrush, stuff like that. I uh, try to keep myself uh, and I'm blessed because at least the dialysis center I can clean myself up, take a shower. I don't have to smell like a homeless person, you know. What are your survival skills? My tenacity. I clean out, won't give up attitude. I mean, that's how I get through with this. I've been doing this for 12 years. Look at my arm. 12 years. I lost my kidneys in a car accident. I was a union fitter making $65 an hour. And now I'm down in uh, the town of Hamburg, screwed me over on the lawsuit because they ticketed me because the woman that hit me was a wife of a judge in Boston. How do you feel about the animal? Depressing. Most of the time, depressing. Sometimes there's a highlight once in a while. You know, but most of the time it's depressing and aggravating, frustrating. What kind of highlight? Uh, when I'm first in line at the food truck. <laughs> <laughs> If you could go back in time and change anything, would you? And what would you change? I wouldn't have rented who I rented from that put me homeless. Because I had a nice apartment, I had a thing, I went in for hernia surgery. I was running from this Muslim guy from Yemen and Lackawanna. And I went in for hernia surgery. He wouldn't do repairs in my apartment, so I wasn't going to pay him rent until he repaired my, you know. Who wants 
sewage dripping on you. And uh, I went in for the hernia surgery, and at the time I got out of the hospital, he'd already got me evicted, three-day eviction on me, and threw all my stuff out. It's amazing how they're pushing people out. That's just my own personal opinion, so you know, the people got the same. It's just I like to see Americans in America own American, you know, not these ones coming from other countries and taking over. I was a weekend alcoholic. But when I woke up out of my coma, I changed my life. What I used to be, I used to be with the outlaws, motorcycle gang. I was, uh, I don't know, I guess you could say, uh, a somewhat bad man. And then I changed my life. I found God. As someone that's very small, this is, yes, I do feel a little bit of um, being treated differently. Yeah. Can you tell me about a time or a situation when you felt that way? Um, actually, between yesterday and today, um, we had our things stored somewhere outside. Um, where nobody could see it, and the city came by, and they seen it, and they didn't bother to ask questions, they just took it, so like when I leave here, I gotta go to the police station to go try to find our belongings, and people look at us like, I mean, yeah, there's probably some alcoholics and drug users out here, but I don't like it when people look at me like that, because it's not why I'm homeless, if that makes sense. So how long have you been homeless for? About eight months. Is this your first time experiencing it? Yes. What do you think is the most common reason that people become homeless? I think financial. Probably financial. Well, I can't really speak on everybody, but I think it's mostly financial. Financial. Lack of money, lack of jobs. I mean, it's all a trickle, trickle effect. That's how I became homeless. I lost my job. Would you mind speaking a little bit more to that? Yeah, I had Section 8, and I couldn't keep up with my part of the rent, and I went to social services for help, and they could only do a little bit for like one month, and then if you break something on the lease with, with Section 8, they could terminate. So once my landlord decided to evict me for non-payment or a partial payment, it was just a downward spiral after that. I got evicted, Section 8, because I was getting evicted, my section, I lost my Section 8, so that's what happened. Um, so do you have family and so how do they feel about you? Um, yes, I have family and they don't really seem to care. So yeah. it was the middle of winter, they, I don't know, they just don't seem to care. What is life like on a day-to-day basis? Exhausting. I'm just kidding. Um, wake up in the morning because you're sleeping. Well, we're sleeping at a place where, you know, police can be called on us. It's a, like an old building down by Canal Side. It's under construction, but it's warm. We don't get wet. We have our blankets. Um, we have to be up by 6 o'clock in the morning to get out there before the construction work is done. And then it's trying to find a bathroom, trying to wash up, trying to brush your teeth, trying to find something to eat. It's just a long day. And then having to repeat it. And take care of your, all your business, getting housing and everything at the same time. It's, it's exhausting. I haven't... I know a lot of people have, but I haven't like got to the point where I need to go steal anything. I don't want to do that. I don't need to add going to jail or anything to the mix. So, um, whatever I can get for free, basically. But, what are some of your survival skills? Um, always watching over my bed, look behind my bed. Um, sitting with one eye. There's certain places that like will feed you on certain days, certain places, and you got you just it's all word of mouth. You have to know you know where to go, what times. And there's quite a few places, well, not not quite a few, but there's a couple places and for different days and different times. And you got to try to keep up with that. So. And if you don't, you don't eat. So you work at the Haven House. 
I do. I'm the program manager at Haven House, which is Erie County's only licensed domestic violence shelter. Do you think the homeless are being dehumanized? I think we've gotten better at humanizing the homeless over the years. I still think we have a long way to go. I think there's a lot of judgment that goes in when someone becomes homeless, but the reality is we're, we, most of us are one paycheck away from not having anything. So I think if we did a lot more better understanding of the homeless and not judging them so much, um, they would become more human to us. How do you feel going to work every day? Well, work is work. So some days I love to be there and some days I'm like, I wish it was the weekend. Um, but for the most part, I really do love my job. It's really nice to see people make small successes when they find an apartment or they get a job or they get their kid in some special program. Um, that really keeps me hopeful and reminds me of the work, why I do the job that I do. Are there any downsides to your job? Like, I, you know, get, hearing everyone's stories, you know, being a domestic violence shelter, I hear a lot of really sad stories, a lot of really bad things that have happened to people. Um, so that can be hard. That's why I think self-care in our world is very important, um, making sure that we're taking care of ourselves and talking to people when it does get a little rough. Um, it is it is hard to hear those stories. Are you personal or close with anybody there? As far as clients? Like homeless. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, my job is a little removed from the day-to-day -day aspect of shelter life, but you, you can't help but get attached to the clients. Um, so it's really, A, important to maintain boundaries when you have a client. Um, but you do. You get attached. You care about them. You want them to do good. You want to see their kids do good. So, yeah, you do get attached to most people that come through the door. Yeah, how do they get to that point of, you know, rock bottom? I think uh, I think people arrive at homelessness in a lot of different ways. I think um, untreated mental health issues can cause that. I think substance abuse that you're not work um, you're not treating could lead to homelessness. And I also think a lack of a support system. Like I said before, if I lost my job suddenly and I didn't get a paycheck next week and I didn't have the great family support I would, I could potentially end up in a homeless shelter. So not having like that family support or that friend support, I think, is a big contributor to why people come home become homeless. If you were able to help more, would you? If so, how would you help? So at Haven House, we have 36 beds, and we're constantly turning people away, even if there is a safety concern. So I think we need more shelters. I think we need more beds available within the city of Buffalo. Um, and I also think working with DSS to um, to up their budget. Right now, uh, a family of four can receive $450, and in the Buffalo area, that's a really hard. it's really hard to find an apartment on that level. So I think... Um, dealing with the realities of 2018, as well as having more beds for people that are in transition to finding permanent housing. How does seeing homeless people make you feel? It makes me feel sad. Obviously, I want everyone to have a home and have access to the resources that I need. Um, but it also makes me feel hopeful, too. If I, you know, if you see a homeless person that does find an apartment, or does get into a transitional living program, it does provide me with a lot of hope that we can do better for our citizens. How do the women specifically at Home and House, Haven House, get to that situation? Sure. So oftentimes the women at Haven House have apartments, have cars, have personal belongings that they have to leave behind because their housing situation has become unsafe for them. So they, they come to us because there's a safety concern. They can no longer safely stay in the house that they have. So it's not like a traditional homeless situation where you don't have anywhere to go, you don't have family to support you. Oftentimes our women can't go live with their family members because their abuser probably knows where their mom lives, probably knows where their close friends live. So it's really the only safe place for them to come. So it's safety for us, which causes our homelessness at the Haven House, or lack of safety, I should say. Um, was there a situation where like, Haven House, it was too full for anybody here to like kick everyone out or um, so we will only take to what we can accept. We can accept 36. That's what where our capacity is at. So when someone calls and there is a need for a domestic violence shelter, we'll work with those women to go to other shelters in different areas. So we work really closely with the domestic violence shelter in Rochester, the one in Syracuse, the one in Niagara Falls. But the reality is that oftentimes those places are filled too. I call Rochester every day and they're like, sorry, no room. Um, so we'll work to do our best to keep them safe in the community. If it's putting them up at a hotel, if it's making a safe plan to stay with a safe individual that their abuser might not know about, we would do that. But yeah, yeah Haven House is often full. Um, has there ever been any males that come in to Haven House with abuse charges, like that got abused? Yes. Um, so Haven House is an all-inclusive shelter. We don't discriminate based on gender, gender expression, gender identity, religion, culture, anything like that. So if you, the reality is it's not 
is normalized for men to be in an abuse situation. They're not likely to report it as much as a female would just because of how society views men and how they think they should be. Um, but we do service men. Uh, we get about one man per year. We actually just had a man that was there with his two, do- two daughters that wasn't in an unsafe situation. Um, so yes, we would take a man as long as there's a safety risk and he is a victim himself. I work for Matt Urban Hope Center as a homeless outreach case manager here in Buffalo, covering five counties. Don't ask me to name all five of them. I definitely know I have a period now. Do you enjoy it? I love my job. I love what I do. Um, and I love who it is we work with. Do you think the homeless are being humanized? I definitely believe the homeless are being dehumanized because they're not spoken about and dealt with as individuals who actually have a purpose and a meaningful place in society. They are lumped together as a degenerate population which is completely inaccurate. It does not take into consideration all the events that took place to lead them to where they are today. How do you feel about going to work every day? This is absolutely the most fun job I've ever had. So coming into work every day is very exciting, challenging. Um, it's a, like a, going to a new job every day because you never know what's going to happen. You don't have a dull moment. You're never bored, ever. <laughs> Most common role to hold? I would say it's probably more an economic problem. Um, so about 70% of the population is one paycheck away from actually being homeless on the streets. Uh, the way the economy is growing, rent prices going up, cost of living not going up, um, or should I say wages not going up to meet the cost of living, makes it a lot more difficult for families to sustain. Um, They have to have two incomes now, whereas it used to be okay with just one. Um, Now our older or elderly population who's on a fixed income, they can't find places that are affordable that leave them enough money to be able to take care of themselves and all their medical or food nutrition needs afterwards. So it's definitely the economy plays a very strong role. In Erie County, we have very high rent prices. So the average mean, somebody can't even afford to rent a home working 40 hours a week at a minimum wage job. They're working two and three jobs to be able to afford an apartment uh, and that of substandard or subpar living. Um, so making housing affordable, building more areas up that would be safe neighborhoods for not just individuals but families to live in. To, uh, what we don't realize is that Buffalo alone has so many abandoned houses that if we actually fix them all up, we could probably house the entire homeless population and not lose any additional space or services for anybody here in this county. I would say having a personal connection with the population that I'm very honored to serve is a requirement to be able to serve them and serve their needs well. Our population that we work with, the homeless, are experiencing a traumatic event. Being without a home, the ability to feed yourself, to be able to clothe yourself is a dehumanizing experience and what we do just barely scratches the surface of trying to solve the problem. Um, So it is very personal to me in the sense that we're all humans, we're all the same. We shouldn't be doing anything but helping one another. Um, To make it a little bit more personal for me personally, it was, I'm a formerly homeless individual and I couldn't imagine being where I am today if I didn't have people that were there when I needed them most to help me out of the situation. So, very much so. Ending homelessness is a community issue, so I'm really glad that you asked that question. It takes, it takes a village to be able to 
to make everything work together. Everybody has to play their role. If everybody did their part in extending a, a little bit more kindness instead of stepping over somebody, understanding why that person might be in the situation they're in, not looking down upon them for being in the situation they are. Removing the stigmas out there, things like the stigma behind mental health or the LGBTQ community being kicked out because people don't want them in their homes. That's your child, <laughs> so I couldn't imagine. But there are so many different facets as we as a, as a population can contribute to. And I'm going to say, you know, one of the biggest things that we can do is starting to take a stronger role in being a voice in the community about what this community needs. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is if we act actively take a role in voting, if we actively get our voices out there and make a stand on what we need to make our county and our community better, it's what we need to do. Um, okay, so that would be a yes and a no. <laughs> uh, if I could go back in time, yes, there are certain things that I would change. I call them survival skills. Uh, some of the things I had to do to make it on an everyday basis. While I was homeless, I would change because I'm sure people got hurt. I would change the fact that my parents and my family were hurt. Um, but I'm going to say no because the experience that I learned being homeless makes me better today at what I do for a living. What I do for a living is not just what I do, it's how I pay it forward, how I take care of the next person because somebody dared to care about me and take care of me when I couldn't. So that's my giving back. Um, being homeless was not anything I, very, I ever saw happening in my past. Um, I had a college degree. Uh, making it on my own, had earned all the socio status things you're supposed to have, a car, a house, and I lost it all. Um, lost the job, <laughs> and one by one items started to go. Um, I know that being homeless was really hard on my family because they felt like I was raised better than that, like it was a choice I made. Um, the only choice I had to end that was just to go home, and I couldn't. My pride got in the way. Um, I was sick. Uh, I was a struggling addict. There were just too many factors going on, and I couldn't face anybody with it. Um, and I probably should have known with my education that it's, it's a disease not, you know, just something I wanted to do for fun. Um, I should have known that my parents were going to still be there for me. My wife was still going to be there for me. Um, but I couldn't face anybody. Uh, it was hard. But making a comeback takes a great setback to make an even better comeback. So today all I focus on is what I'm blessed to have, what I can do for the next person, and continuing to do the right thing and living a life of integrity. When we see somebody who's experiencing homelessness steal food, we don't stop to see that they stole food, we just know that they stole. But that is what we consider a survival crime. You have to eat to make it. You don't always know where your next meal is coming from. You know, you do what you have to do, so. Is there any place or time or is there anything that you do to like find peace, um, peace of mind, like given your current situation? There are little moments throughout the day or, or at night when we're just laying down. It's just like, I could breathe a little bit, like. But then again, I really can't because like, I keep one eye open because I don't know who's coming around the corner. You know what I mean? So it comes and goes. I mean, 
there's a lot of good days. I mean, not every day is bad. It's just, it's a long day. Um, is there anything like advice or something that you would want to share with people who may kind of, because a lot of us are like one paycheck My biggest away. mistake was I didn't reach out for help. I thought I could do it all by myself when things were happening with like, when I lost my job and then trying to like hold on to the little bit of income I had in the bank and not asking like family or friends for help when I knew I was going to get evicted to try to keep the section 8. I tried to do it all by myself. That's what I asked. Like just ask for help. Don't be ashamed. Don't be scared of that. It took me a long, I, I still, like you can ask him, like I don't like asking for help at all. It takes a lot for me to ask somebody for something. So don't be afraid to ask for help because there are people out here willing to help. Why is it, do you think that people don't ask for help? What is it about people in general? I think for me, well, I don't know about everybody else, but I think it has to do with pride. Like, for me, it was my pride. Like, I couldn't believe I was in the situation. Like, I didn't want anybody to know I was in the situation. I didn't want to look like I was in the situation. I didn't want to feel like I was in the situation. So for me, it was, I think for a lot of people, it's pride. Any, any thing I just, I, I would want people not to judge homeless people the way that they do, like, Dirty or rugged, because oh, there. Okay, there, there's, there's, there's a major, some of that, but then there's a majority of us that are not, and that we're out here. We're trying to get a job. We're trying, you know, we're doing everything we can, working with social services. So I just think that's a big misconception that people are out here drinking and doing drugs all day. That's not the case at all. I appreciate you saying. Thank you very You're much. Welcome.